Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, Olivia Gamberlin. Thank you so much for having me here today, Martin. So yeah, you're uh, an entrepreneur and an ethicist. And many people listening to this podcast will be familiar with the day-to-day -day life of an entrepreneur, but maybe less so of a professional ethicist. Tell us, what does that look like? What do your days entail? Well, they're quite busy lately, especially since the onset of generative AI. Uh, but I do say I, I do really wear two different hats. One is the entrepreneur, one is the ethicist. And that ethicist hat, oftentimes I'm the first ethicist that people will meet, which is very fun for me. Uh, they're usually surprised uh, to hear that I am not going to sit there and split hairs with them about good and bad and, and tell them they're a bad person. Um, instead, actually, as an ethicist, my role is a very supportive role. So I specifically work with decision makers. So I'm in with management and leadership teams working through what I call a decision analysis process of, of applying ethics, where we are analyzing the decisions they're making around their strategy and uh, crucial decision making for their technology, specifically AI. And I'm assessing to see its alignment with the ethical values that they've set out for, for the company that they've set out um, either by regulation or, or their own company values. So my work really as a day-to-day -day as an ethicist is, uh, let's say, <laughs> sitting as the um, consciousness underneath everything. Like, you know, the, the Finding Nemo, you have that one scene where Dory is saying, Nemo, I am your conscience. Um, Sometimes that's kind of how I feel where, I, where I'm sitting in these meetings and people are talking, they're getting excited about ideas and I'm going, yes, that's great, but maybe there's a better decision that we can be making here. Or what if, what if, we, what if we tweaked it in this direction, like from the background? So um, I'm not there to force any frameworks or ideas on, any, on anyone. I'm more like uh, a living, breathing moral compass for a company and their, and their AI. Oh, that's, a, that's a nice way of, of uh, framing it. So what took you into the realms of AI specifically then? I'm, the world of ethics can take you into many areas, I'm, I'm sure. So what was it that appealed and, and how did you land in the, in the tech space? I think probably a combination. So I, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, so I grew up around AI. It's, I, I like to joke that that is my first, second language as I speak techie. Um, so I think there was always that focus of, well, of course, the only industry that exists is technology. At least when you grow up in that area, that's kind of what, what you come to believe. And I think, though, later on in life, as I started actually practicing as an ethicist and looking at what field I wanted to, to work in, the field of AI and data attracted me because it's quite an interesting mirror to our, to our own selves, our own humanity. When you're working, say, for example, as an ethicist in medicine or business or politics, you're looking at specific use cases, which is still the same, same case with AI. But with AI, it's almost like that use case is pointed back at the humans. So we're, we're having to address a lot of these very difficult ethical questions that we've been struggling with for, I mean, since the ancient philosophers. And now it's coming back in just in a different format and a different different. Um, different clothing, let's say. So I found, find it fascinating. It brings the work of an ethicist to a whole different scale and realm that really attracted me, I have to say. And I imagine given the, the breadth and the, the, the way that technology touches so many aspects of our lives, you're still getting involved in the, the political, the policy, the governance, the, you know, all of that still very much applies, right? Oh, yes. I like to joke with my fellow ethicists. We have to be ethicists. We have to be politicians. We have to be business analysts. We have to be engineers. We have to be, uh, gosh, anything and everything, because we have to have such a strong working knowledge of so many different fields that impact our day to day work. Yeah. And I can imagine that um, that multifacetedness is, is in high demand right now. So you spoke about the the rise of generative AI. Can you just talk to me about um, your current take on, on generative AI and the ethical uh, considerations or implications of this new tech? Yeah. So I'll talk about it from kind of a business perspective and then from an ethicist perspective specifically. Again, as an ethicist, I work actually quite often on business ethics as well. 
as AI ethics. Those are closely entwined, um, intertwined. But the business perspective around generative AI is it's slower for, uh, let's say, in-depth adoption than I think it's made out to be, meaning I've seen and worked with a lot of companies that are still wrapping their minds around what is the use case for this technology. Very fascinating. And on, a, on an individual level, we can come up with uses for ChatGPT, but that doesn't necessarily directly translate into this is useful for uh, the internal operations of a company. There's also a lot of security considerations and data privacy considerations. So the adoption of generative AI is a lot slower internally than, yeah, than, it, than it's made out to be, which I know sometimes takes people by surprise because it's the hype right now. And then as an ethicist, I would say it's a very, very fascinating tool. To me, it, it's very cool to see, uh, be able to prompt, say, chat GPT with a question and, and know that the answer that I'm getting back is like this giant, um, I think uh, I heard it once described as a word calculator, meaning it's going through all of these different scenarios and, and predictions and possibilities, statistics of what is the next possible word. And that's fascinating to me because the amount of data that it had to process to be able to come back with that answer to show that this is gen generally on average what a person's response will be to this question fascinates me. Absolutely. But as also as an ethicist, I think there is a little bit of my concern comes into the point that we forget the limitations of this technology in the sense that it is really good at giving us a good average. I heard it described once as a mediocre consultant, which is true. It's a mediocre consultant. You're like, yeah, that's good enough. And so you can use it for things that are, that you only really need something that's good enough. But the ideation and the creation still belongs to the people. And I, I, my only concern is that we forget that in this process where, where the default becomes, well, ChatGPT said it, so that's got to be the best answer. That's not true. It's the best mediocre answer. But now it's up to you as the person to then push it to the next level. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And it's something that we've spoken about on the podcast recently is that it's actually great for if you, you know, problem solving, uh, maybe you've got a particular situation with a client. This is a kind of real world consultancy or agency scenario I've had recently where I've had a situation. I've, I've thrown the situation into chat GPT and said, give me all the things I need to consider with this particular thing. And it's kind of spat out 10, 12 considerations eight of them i'd already considered like two or three of them are kind of nonsense and almost irrelevant but one of them is is the kind of nugget of gold that i'd overlooked like it was oh yeah that's given me a bit of a sense check there um but if you were if you were treating it as infallible it, as the the single source of truth um then you're going to incorporate those two or three options that were irrelevant or, or a bit of a nonsense. So yeah, really important to bring that that discretionary element to it. I am um, at the opening you mentioned about um values and the the ethical values of of an organization. And I think that's a a really interesting perspective. Can you talk about the work that you do in terms of helping organizations distill or kind of articulate their their values and then how do we align the, the the practices the use of technology to those values yeah so i use a very specific technique actually when working with with clients to distill their call it like a foundational value set these are the foundational values that they're going to be working off of so we're pulling in information from three different sources First one being regulation or policy that's existing. So looking at that country that the company is operating within, what are the legal systems that it needs to adhere to? So for example, if you, I'm in Belgium right now. Um, if you are operating in Belgium, then you are going to be looking to the EU AI Act. It does have policies and specific values that are outlined within that regulation um, and that legislation. So you, you, the first input is regulation, it's on the country level. 
Second input, you're looking at industry standards. So the clearest example of this one would be a company operating in the healthcare sector. They're going to be looking at things like the Hippocratic Oath and medical ethics. These are longstanding values and standards within the industry. Some industries have more robust uh, and easily identifiable value sets than others, but there is always this kind of think like standard practice within um, within an industry. So that's that's the second input. Third input is actually the company itself. Those the company values, which the company should have values at this point in time. And these are ones that you can either find written on the wall or say, here are our company values and this is what our brand embodies and our mission, distilling out from there, what are the values there? Those three inputs, there is a process to actually triangulate between the three. We are looking for commonalities between them. So when you find a value such as, I'll use a, a, a buzz one, trust, that hits on all three of those value sets, that's a core value. That means no matter where, where you're looking, you need to have that. Um, versus say you have a value like transparency that's only showing up on two of those those inputs. That's still an important value, but you're you're less likely going to be using that as a core value and more of one that helps you with prioritization. And um, let's say detailed decision making, that one will be weighing in. So uh, it's a very, it's, it's actually a very clear process of bringing together this core foundational value set. And then to answer the second part of your question, when it comes to decision making off of that, there are two approaches. So you're looking at a value, let's say trust again, and you can either take a risk-based approach or an innovation-based approach. The risk-based approach is you are trying to protect for that value. You are trying to prevent um, that value from going wrong. So um, actually, let's use privacy. This one's, this one's an easier, easier example case. So privacy, you're protecting for privacy. That means that you're following the GDPR. You're ensuring that you're compliant in terms of data collection policies and, pra and practices. It's very focused on, I am protecting and preventing from things going wrong. The innovation side though, you're looking more at alignment and design. So that's something where you're gonna see privacy by design, meaning you are incorporating elements that are respectful of the user's privacy from the very start, from the very design itself. So both of these approaches are very important. And it's good to have a balance between the two, but companies will naturally tend towards one versus the other. So you protect or you align. And that depends on the company itself and the objectives around this. But um, to summarize, you have an easy process for finding your values, and then you're either looking to protect or align with those values. Having sat in multiple sessions with leadership teams looking at values, I feel like you're downplaying how easy it is to arrive at those set of values. I know what those yeah. workshops can be like, right? We always have this problem because I say, oh, it's easy. And then I had a friend saying, you really have to stop saying that because it's not easy. It's easy for you. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's fair. I've done this enough. I, it's easy for me. It's very fun for me. I think it's, it's really fascinating conversations and you really have to, to pay attention as people are talking to, to pull out the common threads. Um, but that is not easy. Let me rephrase that. It is not easy, but there is a clear process. Uh, yeah, I, I grant you that. The, um, I love the idea that that little framework of the, the regulatory, the industry and the, and the corporate. I think that's a really nice, uh, nice methodology. So yeah, thanks for, for, for sharing that. Um, so when it comes to kind of taking the next steps with this, um, you have developed something called the ethics maturity continuum. Is that right? Is that, is that the next stage of the, the process in terms of the engagement that you would take someone with, or have I misunderstood? Can you talk us through what that, that continuum is? Yeah. So the ethics maturity continuum is designed specifically to be used by either uh, venture capitalists and investors or by startups. Uh, there are two different layers, let's call out to the continuum. One is for younger startups. So you're looking seed to series B. And then the second layer is for series, C's, series C and above in terms of investment rounds. Um, and this is specifically for startups. There are, you can actually take this continuum and use it uh, within teams within larger companies. Um, but the 
continuum is basically designed to help catch blind spots. So it's got five different value pillars and with each of those prompting questions. And it is, you are self-assessing, but you're looking at, yes, I have uh, this in place or I don't have that in place or um, this sounds, this, I, I identify most with this, with this description versus this one. And, and what it does is it, um, I know I'm talking very, very vaguely, but um, it allows you to understand your risk score when you're just starting out. And these, these five uh, pillars have been focused on what are the main risk spots, basically, that a startup will encounter when first developing AI, um, an AI product. So the continuum allows venture capitalists to either assess for ethical risk in a potential investment, or it allows startups to actually be able to catch a blind spot and be able to showcase to investors, stakeholders, and so on, look, this is where we land within the continuum. Uh, interesting. I Yes, I think I misunderstood the uh, the application of it there. So that's um, that is an interesting one to me because immediately I think to myself, well, I can I can see how, you know, even mature teams that haven't been through that process themselves, that sounds like it would be, it would be useful there as well. This, I mean, ethics is, you know, you talk about blind spots, right? I would, I would say that ethics is often a blind spot. It's, it doesn't come up all the time in conversations. I mean, certainly with product teams, marketing teams that I engage with, um, it's, it's a regular blind spot, right? There's, there's, they understand the pri the basics of things like respecting people's privacy, but it tends to be very much on that kind of, what do we have to do on a legal compliance perspective, not the kind of wider ethical, you know, what are our values? How do we want to operate basis? So yeah, I, I, I maybe understood the ethics maturity continuum to be applicable to wider teams, but uh, no, that's interesting that it's for, for startups. Yeah, it's um, it was specifically designed for startups, but there are different frameworks out there that do exist for teams beyond startups. Um, you can find frameworks and processes that are uh, openly accessible. You do have to, uh, let's say, customize them to your own to your own needs. Uh, but the purpose of those is to actually be able to walk teams through specific decision making or. Um, specific value implementation. For example, there's a lot of fra fairness frameworks out there. Fairness is a very difficult value to implement, but there's a lot of different fairness um, frameworks that allow a company to see this. these are the questions and when and where we need to ask these questions to ensure that we are doing to the best of our ability uh, elimination of unwanted bias. Yeah, that's a, an important consideration. And just, I can see how that's very, applicable to companies developing the tech. If we were to look at companies that are, you know, take a, a typical medium-sized enterprise at the moment, that is, they're not developing any tech themselves, but they're looking to implement these existing technologies into their workflows. You know, maybe they're looking at the likes of, you know, open AI, seeing all of the hype around the products that they're putting out and, you know, they've done their, they've done a bit of due diligence and they've, they've seen that open AI has spent a lot of money on red teaming and things like that. And they've gone, yeah, people are, people are on this. Someone's thought about this. It's a safe product. What would you say to those teams? How should they approach the, the implementation of AI tech into their workflows? So I would say you want to focus on two points here. One actually being during the procurement process of truly analyzing a, a supplier. I've seen companies have a lot of success in actually developing what is an ethics procurement questionnaire uh, that allows them to assess not necessarily, and I want to stress this, not necessarily if the company has done all of the, let's say, right things, meaning having a red team, um, having a responsible AI policy and so on, but more looking at assessing if that supplier company, the values of that supplier company align with 
the company that is procuring the technology because you can have a company that is developing, let's say, a safe product um, and they are going through the right processes, but they prioritize transparency over privacy. And you are a health tech company and you're procuring this, this, this um, information, you're procuring this, this, a, let's say AI, and you need to prioritize privacy over transparency because of the sensitivity of, of the data that goes through, that's going to go through that system for you. That, although small difference in prioritization can result in very different outcomes for a company. So you, with those procurement processes, you're looking for alignment in, let's say, prioritization of values. Um, of course, also checking to make sure that, that, that they've done the right things, but uh, even more so looking at if those values are in alignment. That's one. One point, the second point here for teams that are looking to implement procured AI um, is ensuring that, and it sounds very simple, but ensuring there is a human in the loop monitoring the progress. So there's this misconception of I am buying a full package. It's good. It's done. I can just put it running, no problem. It's not how AI works. When a model is live, when, you've been, when you have deployed your system, um, it's now taking in live data. And that live data is going to, let's say, influence the model. So you do need someone that's actually monitoring the output closely to ensure, hey, this is, this is drifting. It happens all the time. You have model drift. Uh, this is drifting from what we originally intended it for. Or there, it, it's drifting. We're not getting the results that we wanted out of it. Um, versus, yes, it's good. It's in alignment. It's doing what we wanted it to. We haven't caught any any challenges. Um, you need someone in that that monitoring position. That's actually one of the most important positions is is monitoring that that human in the loop, making sure that the deployed system is continuing to perform as you expect it to, because it will change, and you need to be able to to identify that uh, as fast as you can and catch it before it, it's gone too far. Let's say. And I think that goes to that earlier point about putting too much trust and faith into chat GPT. It's the same thing with any model, isn't it? You just kind of set it up and go, oh no, it knows what it's doing. We, we, we built it. Off it goes. Um, no, so I think that's, that's a, a really important, uh, important point. You, um, just going back to something you mentioned earlier about the, the regulatory landscape, you mentioned the, the EU AI Act. Um, that's going through the European Parliament as we speak. Um, what are your thoughts on it? It takes a, a person-centered risk-based approach. Do you, do you think it's, it's good? Do you think it goes far enough? Have you any, any critiques of it? Well, it is risk-based. I, as a personal preference, tend to prefer innovation-based, but that's my personal preference as, as just an ethicist. I'm very much a design thinker. But I would say with the EU AI Act, I am concerned with some of the risk categorizations because you can develop a system in a low risk category and then, let's say, apply it into a high risk category and potentially. So examples like that, there's there's a few holes that I that I think will be covered once the once the um, regulation is in effect, but kind of like the GDPR with legitimate interest hole where everything's suddenly legitimate interest. I think we're going to see very similar aspects of that with the AI Act. I'm also curious to see how it works in terms of application. Um, I know, for example, a lot of member states still struggle with actually having uh, their data protection officers, DPOs in place for the GDPR. So we're still struggling with GDPR implementation. Um, the one place that I find it falling short and because all, all of the, the things that I mentioned that can be corrected over time and, and we do just need to basically, well, I'll speak techie here, deploy it so that we can actually see how it goes um, to be able to, to, to correct for those, those blind spots. But the the hole that I see that 
I think has me most concerned is actually the startup ecosystem here in here in Europe and any startup that's looking to to operate within the European market, not because regulation is is a constraint on innovation, I think quite the opposite, but instead because this regulation, this 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 AI act, it puts a heavy emphasis on documentation and auditing. That costs time, money, resources, that costs a lot. And so I have heard investors specifically say, post AI Act, we're not investing in any high risk categories. So my fear, unless the EU sets up specific, let's say, institutions or um, resources for startups, they're going to cut off a lot of innovation that's going that could happen in the higher risk that could happen totally fine responsibly in the high risk, but only because startups do not have the resources to comply with the documentation required for those risk categories. So that's that's my big concern. I haven't seen enough movement there um, in terms of covering the potential consequences for that. Yeah, that's um, I think the auditability, the the being able to interrogate the models and understand how it's arrived at decisions and what have you is, is such a big part of it. Yeah. I think that, um, you can see why, why people would be, uh, concerned if they were building from the ground up, um, like you say, getting the systems and processes in place to do that could be quite a serious ask. Right. Um, we are heading towards the end of, uh, of this podcast, but I would like to jump into the role of marketing teams specifically as it relates to responsible AI. Is that something that you've, you've looked at in great detail? Have you got any advice for, for marketing professionals uh, working in and around this, this tech? Yes, absolutely. And marketing is one of the interesting ones because it's often overlooked as having any type of impact or role in responsible AI. Um, when I say responsible AI, I mean the industry of, of uh, let's say, AI governance, ethics, safety, risk, et cetera, et cetera. This all fits under the term responsible AI. Um, and typically people think, oh, responsible AI is for tech teams. But marketing teams and marketing professionals have a very important role to play really in two different directions. The first one is in communication. So when it comes to responsible AI, there is this risk of something called ethics washing, where a company says, look at us, we're so ethical. And then you lift up the, the hood, you look behind the curtain, you're like, Woo, what's going on here? That is not right. It's kind of like, um, it's also known as blue washing, which is, it, it, it's similar to if you've ever heard the term green washing, where companies say, look, we're so environmentally friendly. And then you, you pull back the curtain, you're like, you're dumping the gallons of oil into the ocean. I don't call that environmentally friendly. <laughs> um, similar with ethics, where, where a company can say, look, we have our values. And then you look and you're like, well, but you don't use them. So uh, that's something called ethics washing. And what that does is it creates a, a very intense mistrust with, with a customer base. So customers can see through. You can say, we respect your privacy. And then a customer is actually going through the user experience and they're having to submit like their mother's maiden name. And they're thinking, that's not, no, why do you need that? That, that you're telling me one thing and you're acting in, a, in another way that doesn't sit right with me. So for marketing professionals, being able to accurately represent and communicate with a user base, how the company approaches responsibly or how the company approaches ethics is incredibly important because that's, what's going to be a huge trust builder. You can have all of the work being done behind the scenes with the tech teams, ensuring that there are strong ethical solutions in place. But if you're not being able to communicate with that user base through your marketing, that that is done in, in a way that is holistic, then you are both going to miss out on the benefits of responsible AI, but also you, you risk uh, creating this kind of mistrust with your user base. So on one hand, marketers have this very important role of that trust building communication with user bases. But then mar marketers can also have the ability to uh, be a fantastic resource for feedback. So for example, if they're getting feedback from, their, from the audience saying, 
you we don't trust you or we think that uh, you don't have very fair practices. That's a great point in time to feed that information back to your tech and your, and your product and your leadership teams. So marketing really actually has a very important role. They're, they're the trust builders and they're also that, that insight point of, uh, point of insight for teams to be able to better connect with their user base. And this is all under the umbrella of responsible AI uh, and successful implementation of ethics and values and technology. So a big role for marketing to play in the communication and the interface between uh, the, the customers and the, and the, and the tech teams, uh, an important role to play. Uh, fantastic. So, um, well, thank you for joining us. I believe, am I right in saying you've got a, uh, a book in development? Yes. Yes. I am currently at the phase of, dear God, what am I doing? Um, so I'm about two thirds of the way through <laughs> But uh, my book is coming. I'm with Kogan Publishing uh, and publication is set for summer, June 2024. Um, my title is Responsibly I Implement an Ethical Approach in Your Organization. Big surprise. Well, uh, I would love to have you back on closer to release date to talk about Responsible AI and uh, the book launch in general. Um, where can people find you online? Absolutely. You can check me out at oliviagamblin.com. And I am actually going to be starting a newsletter soon, mm-hmm. all around this idea of pursuit of good tech and uh, the crosshairs of ethics, design, thinking, and leadership in AI. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but you can sign up on my website. You can also find me on LinkedIn uh, under the name Olivia Gamblin. I do respond to messages on LinkedIn. It sometimes takes me a while, but I do respond. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us on Artificially Intelligent Marketing. Thank you for having me here today, Martin.